Thank you, Mayor, for a great presentation. Uh, that leaves me now the chance to be at uh, challenging that program. Um, I'd like to thank, to thank uh, College for its invitation, its board, its committees that gave the opportunity to include this lecture within the 60 public events of the year and including into the calendar of Urbana. And they gave me so this opportunity to address this daunting title, Psychoanalysis and Our Time. In more or less than an, an academic hour. Um, in front of a title like this, the first question is, what does our time mean? Maybe the fact that I'm addressing this public in Vernon College is one of the elements of the answer itself. Because if I uh, follow what President of Barnard said, Ms. Deborah Spar, she stated that she had the chance to preside the destiny of an extraordinary generation of young women grappling with new ideals about feminism and new views of women's power and leadership. Unlike the mothers and grandmothers, this generation is accustomed to a world defined by choice. The choice of reproduction, the choice of gender identity, the choice of educational options and careers. That's, without doubt, one element, one crucial element, of what our time means. We will live in a world in which new leaders will be made out of this generation of young women. And that will change in a new way the relationship between men and women and all the gender prerequisites that were supposed to be in the routine, in the tradition, and would we move deeper. Am I the one bigger fit to try my hand at the challenge precisely of exploring this new world? Look at me. I'm a white male over 60, French, ex-president of an international association. All this in New York, it's difficult to, uh, to assume. If one remembers what happened to one of our ex-president of the International Multilateral Fund. <laughs> That's why for tonight, at least, I didn't put a time on. <laughs> the question of uh, the genuine equality for women, said uh, John Scott, the eminent American historian of France, after the, uh, all the discussions open by the DSK affair. She said, all well, this has been deferred since the French Revolution. And now we have a new debate that opened, but uh, at the same time, we must say that the other kind of uh, kind of fatigue in the uh, Central American media that makes this perhaps a little behind us. At least, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, one another element 
of what our time means is the fact that also to address an audience in New York about this topic is one element of the answer also. New Yorkers suffered enough to know that the 21st century and first century began here on the 1911th as the moving ceremony recorded 20 days ago. One of its legacies is the bizarre state of exception that, like Mark Dennis says in the uh, New York Review of Books, that state of exception that corroded the rule of law in a strange manner. That rule, so essential to the American exceptionalism, but also crucial in the building of the European experiment. That state of exception, I quote then, is a position at the limit between politics and law, an ambiguous, uncertain, borderline fridge at the intersection of the legal and the political. We are living in a different time, in which broad acceptance of that endlessness of states of exception, its increasing normalization, are among its distinguishing ones. This state of exception marks something more general, the importance of norms to face the vast unknown we fear. The American exceptionalism makes it clearer here than anywhere that modern democracies have entered a twilight world in its relation to the law and we don't know when we will emerge from it. This importance is part of the redefinition of our context. The confidence we have in established fictions is teetering. We are now a whole array of fictions that govern our world that we cannot believe in, especially these two big fictions that are named dollar and euro. <laughs> Always on the brink of collapse. More for the euro. The question is open, does the euro and Europe have a future? But dollar and euro are linked like uh, Europe and America. George Soros is right when it says that the Euro crisis is a direct consequence of the crash of 2008. When Lehman Brothers founded, the entire financial system began to collapse and had to be put in artificial life support. We are paying for it. The ups and downs of the stock exchange measure the difficulty we have to believe, to trust.
And now, the crispation of politics in which the two sides, whether in Europe or in the States, accuse themselves of class warfare. <coughs> or in Europe, like the economist said, it's fair ground for hunting the rich. We are closing the era opened in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall that led to Fukuyama well known illusions, announcing the end of history. The gates of the temple of history are reopened again in a new context, in which no one really seems in charge. Psychoanalysis summarized this state of affair, saying that the belief in the father's figure is waning for good. Something else is needed. And the call for strong feminine leaders appear like a symptom of the disbelief in the old way. A whole new list <coughs> of feminine world's leaders appear, iron ladies of all sorts, from the mainstreams to the bizarre. Michelle Obama, Nancy Pelosi, Angela Merkel, Martin Aubry, Michelle Bachmann. There's a symptom that probably we need to change. We will believe it. Will it be sufficient? Will it be the right sleight of hand to bring back confidence? Nobody really seems to know, and the long-awaited concept that we bring back and restore confidence is running into the contradiction of the master signified. There is still nowhere from our situation can be read, can be read. That defined our times. But the crisis of the father figure, the supposed to know where we will go from here, is a direct introduction to the paradoxes of the psychoanalytic world. Do we really need to have a someone in charge? Do we really need this fiction? Maybe the question of the function of belief, of belief, and the idea of being in charge have to be put to question. At least we could say we have science left. The certainty gives us. Modern democracy only accept this proof. But science itself has as its core of its process paradox. Scientific and technical progress rapidly rendered the organization of daily life obsolete and for most of us goes way beyond our capacities of comprehension. As such, we now only depend more than ever on others, whereas we are ceaselessly affirming our irreductible individuality and our absolute rights to intellectual autonomy. Science because becomes every day no more certain or turn towards certainty than ordinary language was. Like science, language is a collective effort. Although we have 
all of us, private use of any language. We depend more on the supposed to know more than knowledge itself. So we are faced with a double movement. On the one, on the one hand, crisis in the authority figures, and on the other hand, a new dependence on the subject supposed to know, guarantee of the system of belief. And yet, despite, despite this inguishing incertitude, we will be showing in what sense it is possible to speak in praise of this symbolic deficit. These impasses mean that we are all feeble-minded. It is for this very reason that psychoanalysis and its discourse can come to our aid. And this I will join Mayor Janus in its presentation of the drawings, spending drawing we have announcing the event. We are also so let's come to the other element of the time. <coughs> if we have a rough sketch of what our time means, what does psychoanalysis mean? You have such a lot of way of understanding what psychoanalysis means. As Freud told us, the best way to know what psychoanalysis means is to begin by the experience of dreaming. It can be described as a curious cognitive experience no one there seems in charge of these chaotic and vivid experiences that assail the dreamer. He can wake up either exhilarated or anguished, forgetful of what the dream was about, or remembering quite neatly fragments of it that usually means something for him, for the dream. Although the exact meaning remains to be decided, deciphered. <coughs> we feel that these dreams are ours. That's strange. A recent piece by John Searle <coughs> commenting on uh, Antonio Damasio's book on the self stresses that whatever the cognitive approach, the unconsciousness of the dream introduces us to the paradoxes of conscience. Consciousness comes in degrees, and all the range from frantic intensity to just barely being awake. But all of them are degrees within consciousness. There is no such thing as an hybrid form of consciousness. And Damasio insists that wakefulness is essential for conscience. And precisely, it is absent in the experience of sleep, in the uh, deep sleep uh, cycles of REM. In a dream, even the simpler ones, the dreamer, like Freud said, is in all the places. Let's take, what does that mean? Let's take a very simple, simple dream. A simple child dream. You forbid one three years old child to eat more strawberry cake. And so he dreams at night. 
only one word is here and remains. Strawberries. So, yes, it was a delusionary satisfaction of desire. He ate his cake, her cake, during the night. The forbidden fruit has appeared. But at the same time, why did the dreamer choose precisely this forbidden, this magic fruit, and not another one? That brings us back to what happened in Paradise Lost and Eve. At the same time, the dreamer recognizes its object of satisfaction and the place of the one who forbids it. The dreamer, at the same time, is the one that states the rule and the one that breaks the rule. <coughs> it's the same when we dream of sexual satisfaction, dissatisfaction, often break the rules or the norms whatever they are. But they do more than that. They introduce us to world beyond representation, any representation. Lacan contrasts the dream of consciousness with the world of the dream itself. In the dream, however vivid the perceptions may be, or even on account of their intensity or their distortion. We can say that the dreamer is in all places at once, but at the same time. Even the dreamer can say in the dream, this is only a dream. At anguishing moments, the dreamer can withdraw from the dream or dream a little bit further saying to itself, it's on the dream. But that never implies that the dreamer could say, after all, I am the dream's consciousness. It's a dream does not imply this consequence. As the dreamer is in all the places, he cannot utter an I am, since the dream itself is an I am. I am the dream. The experience of the dream, by its articulation of the visible and invisible, and by the impossibility of this consciousness of being there, is very close to what happens in the sexual encounter. So, like you said, there it's some kind of Heideggerian experiment with the design. With the design. Lacan even said once in this overture of the uh, Vedicans' Spring Awakening. <coughs> that boys wouldn't have any kind of relation with girls if they didn't have their dream to guide them. What an absurd declaration it seems. In a proposition during the era of sexual liberation, when he pronounced this in the 60s, at the end of it. And now, today, in the era of hypermodernity, where a little boy watched pornographic film from the age of 12 on and had access to all the information. Nevertheless, whatever the degrees of democratization of pornography, of putting women's bodies in all possible positions and garments, at the general disposal of the populations, this does not correspond with the experience of sexuality. If it weren't for the dream, 
there will be no way of placing, placing the two sexes in relation in abolishing the distance between perception and the dream. The dream, it reduces the world where a possible mingling of bodies can be approached. In the dream, the mode of articulation between jouissance is invisible and the world of representation takes shape. It marks a passage from the invisible to what is in, in form, said that. At the same time, precisely something that is not the form of the body. John Updike and Martin Amis, two novelists, <coughs> approach this. Updike, in its classic, elegant, precise prose, wanted to describe what the sexual experience was beyond any comedy of rules. He had the ability to convey the nature of erotic experience quite special among <coughs> modern novelists. Martin Amis said two things about him that I like most. One, that Joyce himself said that certain things are too embarrassing to be written down in black and white. Updike was congenially unembarrassed, and we are the beneficiaries of that. He took the novel to another plane of intimacy. And the second thing he said, commenting about the project of his new novel, The Pregnant Widow, he said, I wanted to write sexual memoirs, but this is impossible. Abdike tried it. He went into the bed with precision instruments, something like a Japanese crew of high-definition TV. But even with this, it didn't work. The fact that the dreamer loses himself in the experience of the dream has profound meanings for the structure of the symbolic. And consequences that uh, are usually bypassed. When we state that the 20th century was marked by the publication of uh, the interpretation of dreams by Freud, we forget that it was at the same time accompanied by Russell's great forays in logic. Frege, before Russell, just at the end of the 19th century, had allowed for objects as vast as the list of all the lists to be thought through in logical terms. By, this by distinguishing those lists that contain themselves from those that don't, Russell made a variation paradox of infinity appear that would generate a whole world, but a world that would be more unstable than anything Frege, the conceptual writing had dreamed of. The logical revolution of the 20th century is described without making the link with the text from Freud and the one from Russell. That's the link that that convey. His psychoanalysis tries to make visible the consequences of this linking of the dreamer everywhere and nowhere 
and the paradoxes of the infinite. The fraudulent subject, read by Lacan, is structured like Russell's set, caught in the fundamental paradox. It will never attain a definite description of the jouissance that's his, a description that would contain it. In a way, it's the reverse of the fixation that the sadomasochistic ceremony aims at, where the subject attempts by any means possible to maintain himself as the consciousness of the experience of jouissance that takes place, to maintain a scenario and accomplish it by having written it right to the last line. In the dream, the dreamer finds himself in the zone of the no one anymore. In French, plus personne. The fabric of the subject, which is just thus produced, is not representation, but its limit, which implies the irreductible of jouissance. with this consonance between the analytic experience or as the dream is approached within the analytical discourse and our civilization with its feeling of plus personne. The flaw in the symbolic order appears and deepens. So we have a twofold reaction, a twofold desire has come to light in accordance with the iron law of the superego. On the one hand, we hear an invasive call for security and its corollary, the installation of a society of surveillance with its crazy panoptics, multiplications of machines and of video objectivation. And on the other, we have the fascination for living like a machine so as to be delivered from the contradiction of civilization, from saint -Blanc. We have an implacable logic that ache takes us from Georges Bataille à Céphal to the neuronal man Drained off by neuroscience, or by some uses of neuroscience. The consequence of this liberation from the relation to the other and its own law is that the role and the place of the principle of authority in general is undermined, especially in the treatment, in psychoanalysis. We cannot get out of it by increased order, nor by means of pompous sanglon. How can psychoanalysis experience can deal with the contemporary egalitarianism, with its demands for transparency? With its demands that every step should be explained and precisely defined in any treatment in which the subject is 
involved. What we can say is precisely that within the analytical discourse, psychoanalysis and psychoanalysis are in a dissymmetric position, but on the same side of the unconscious. What are the inventions of Lacan? The fact that he touched to the timing of the analytic session, the so-called short session, the punctuation of the text of the analysis is to stress that to face the basic flaw of the symbolic order, there is no other satisfaction than the inventions of the dream presents us. We are not and will never be responsible or in charge for what appears, but invents itself within the unconscious texts that go through us. The language is traumatic. It destroys the language of the unconscious is traumatic. It destroys the illusions of the ego or the illusions of being in charge. At the same time, the dream, it's not the ultimate word of the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic experience. The dream is a delusionary satisfaction of desire. At the same time, the dream itself invents the way in which we can wake up. Within the dream are nothing together at the same time a desire to sleep and the fact that in the dream presents itself a real experience a new level of intimacy with the traumas that define our most singular experience The real satisfaction is there. We can see how, in this way, Lacan commented Freud's dream of the Irma's injection. To get out of the labyrinth of its guilt about what happened to his friend Irma that he had sent to fleece to have her operated and the disaster that followed. At the end, Freud see the formula of the trimethylamine and Lacan said for him it was the discovery of psychoanalysis. There is no other way to get rid of our guilt than the text of the unconscious itself. Without any guarantee, without any idea, what's left is what can be invented there. There is no word beyond the word itself. It's the immanency of the solution that is indicated there. 
No transcendence. Nowhere. Pure imminence. What we want is for the psychoanalysis in our time is an analyst that can occupy this place not of guiding the subject but taking the risks of inventing with him according to what's possible in the particular structure of the unconscious of the subject calculated risk but not entirely submitting himself to protective and mortifying prohibitions <coughs> without, for all of that, falling into therapeutic activism. That's how we can guide the subject within the symbolic disorder to the ways in which he can name the traumas that for himself were decisive and were this most defining moments for him. The movements of psychoanalysis is twofold. On the one hand, it authorizes the loosening of the identification with master signifiers, with the ideals the subject comes at the beginning of the analysis. And that, on the other hand, it allows for a tightening around the whole. For instance, take the example of the subject marked by the scene where he surprises his parents' love making. He retains the memory of an enigmatic phrase from his mother. Come back when the sky is violet. In French, reviens quand le ciel sera violet. The problem is that there is an homophony between the color, violet, and the rape, violet. This subject was left in the labyrinth of these neuroses with an interrogation. What were, what were exactly the relationship between his mother and being raped? Why did she choose that one? The question was more and more insistent after his in the adolescence and beyond. This conundrum of what exactly was her intention saying that occupied him during a good part of his analysis <coughs> and it led him to sort out the aggressive relationships he had with women. And it appeared like a pure contingency, like a whole in the whole fabric of his unconscious so at the end he could separate himself from that and invent new kind of relationships named otherwise the real in the dream that talked to us has to be acknowledged by the presence and the intervention, the intervention of the analysts of course. It has to acknowledge the fact that if no one is in charge, the experience of jouissance is in charge of guiding the subject. And it has to be responsible for its consequences. 
with no prior judgment, only to be responsible for what was the thing he had to face. That's why the psychoanalytic experience in our times, like before, is critical of all the recognized ideals of the powers that exist, of the, those who feel they are in charge. That's why analysts are criticized. In democracy, they are accused of benign neglect. Of what should really bear would be really their social usefulness <coughs> to their clients. They fall short of social Utilitarianism. It's clear that the jouissance and what's useful oppose themselves. Outside democracies, they can be more directly challenged. We see that in the difficulties psychoanalysts have within the Arab world and at the same time, the opportunity they have. In this changing world. You remember that Bernard Lewis made himself the champion of the thesis that the Muslim world would never change. Edward Said challenged him, saying that Muslim in the singular is an invention of the Orientalists of the Western world. The times seem to confirm what say opposed. The Iranian urban upheaval two years ago on the occasion of the Trump re-election of the president was followed this year by the Arab Spring due to the demise of obsolete forms of power. New voices could be heard in their diversity. Especially you could hear testimonies from psychoanalysts in Lebanon, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt. These days, we have heard of a colleague that has been in prison in Syria. These psychoanalysts tell us about the shifts within the tectonic plate of desire within the Muslims' world in Peru. That's the importance of the Last testimony we heard last week of a psychoanalyst was jailed in Damascus, 66, 66 years old, frail, ill, for doing nothing more than the <coughs> dynamics on what fear is in a situation of civil strife like the one experimenting Syria. We are concerned not only because it is a humanitarian cause, but also because it is a symptom of how a psychoanalyst at the nexus of multiple causation can be seen as a danger <coughs> only because he tries to listen to what the fears in a certain context are and doesn't want to make them silenced. Jacques Anamilaire, the psychoanalyst with its Lacan seminars, has taken the initiative of a petition that circulates worldwide, with people signing from all walks of life, 
and political walks of life. Right, left, conservative, progressist are interested because it cannot be assigned to a precise cause. This psychoanalyst has a name. Her name is Afanase. And we hope that during the conference that will follow, we will also have the signatures of uh, people here in New York, uh, whether students or professors interested in that. In the US, Judith Butler has already signed, and probably others will not in the West Coast, but in the East Coast. With this symptom, we see how psychoanalysis is about waking from false dreams. False entanglements, bizarre ones, real and imaginary jails. We can be in charge of this goal without being overconfident of the, on the ones supposed to be in charge of the norms, of the gender definition, and or the invention of the new fiction for this century. These fictions are not already written down. We want to see them and we want to see what will come. Thank you. Uh, 
said there are the, the open, what exactly where, where the toll tennis courts would be? They're on Wall Street and they're that basically they call themselves the one percent and they're protesting the economic situation in America right now where 99% of the wealth is held by like this minority. You know, finally, like we have middle class people coming out, pilots, um, postal workers, people who had job security, they're finally coming out and saying this is unacceptable. Finally. They have a quite different question. <laughs> The experience of orgasm I was pointing out to. It's the experience of dreaming <coughs> of an erotic dream as such, with or without orgasm. In the experience of the dream, of the erotic dream, you don't have a representation of what's going on. You can be, it's true, at the place of the voyeur and see the whole scene, but you are all the places. The voyeur, the one who experiments, and precisely you're lost in that. There's no cognition of the precise experience. There's always a loss somewhere. And precisely this experience of entanglement with another body, the erotic one. If that's the same time, auto-erotic, but with another body, and without the representation. Orgasm, of course, is the cut off. The cut, William Morris would say. The real cut. But, uh, before that, you have this, this strange experience that led Lacan to say boys and girls would never sleep together if they didn't have the experience of dreams. Otherwise, they rather would stay on a pornographic experiment. Watch. There, the experience of it gives us an idea of what the erotic world is beyond any possible representation of it, beyond any form, any shape of the bodies. So in that sense, it's prior to the experience of the orgasm that we can feel this punctuated by orgasm and its dissolution of a mere agency. So, uh, in a way, orgasm confirms, is prepared by the dreamers itself is alone. The notion that what is exactly a social representation has to do with what dreams are. Uh, my friend uh, Jacqueline Miller who just published today in uh, a magazine, French magazine called Le Point, a paper in which he develops what he said uh, uh, last week in Paris in the Lacan 
come to the seminars. Seminars about that. Then, um, what's clear, at least in Europe, is that the left has only one policy, one politics, to make us dream. Dream of a better world. With its acceptance, at least on the uh, French left, with its acceptance of the rule of the market, its hopes of regulations that never arrive. The ever developing consequences of the crisis of 2008. We have a dream policy. And he opposes precisely what can be the policy of dreams formulated best probably by uh, Pierre Rosanvalon, political thinker, who said <coughs> the left lacks an utopia. Do we really need an utopia or do we need to wake up? That's uh, something that can be developed. But it's true that if we understand the dreams not as an utopia, in the sense that the utopia that has no place, but as an experiment in which the dreamer is in all the places and, for instance, is not identified with one class, whether middle class, whether the rich, dreaming to be like the rich and famous and people. Not dreaming but being in all the places sufficiently to experiment that the way to wake up is to make himself here, to protest. To protest the fact that he doesn't have any confidence to the one in the ones that are supposed to be in charge of these utopias. The movement that uh, we see now, whether in the uh, United States or in Europe, the is in France Indignados, the, these movements, urban, uh, middle class, educated, which it's true are similar in that way what happened in the, uh, in the Arab Spring. These movements are probably, uh, we, we have to help to transform these movements in the sign that something new is waking. And probably that routine politics that define the uh, old ways of separating um, right from left in Europe and in, maybe in the United States. The bipartisan standpoint may be perhaps something that has to be overcome. The defining of a new political purpose. That's what's at stake. 
from the big day, now our experience uh, that we'll have in the following years. Psychoanalysis can help. In a way that it will not condone all delusions. So, in a certain way, the two questions were linked. Uh, yes, thank you. If you said symbolic disorder, then would you explain it? Uh, because I'd like to obtain the concept of by violence to it. Did I hear you, know, you say symbolic disorder earlier? Can you repeat the question? Uh, I thought that I heard you say symbolic disorder. Yes. Right. Uh, then would you explain? Uh, what you meant a little bit because I'd like to obtain the concept before I do some violence to it. <laughs> yes, uh, symbolic disorder uh, meaning that usually the description of our, of our state of civilization it is, is described commonly as a disorder. Things are not in place. And people protest. I try to give some description of it in a way that it shows also that it's a new order that is presenting itself. But at the same time, this new order has to include the fact that there is a fundamental flaw in any symbolic possible order. And that's the real aspect. We will never have a symbolic order as we knew it. But not only as we knew it, what appeared is the fundamental flaw of any possible order. And the symbolic order as such is a kind of illusion. Ah, uh, good of that. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is, um, I'm wondering how psychoanalysis distinguishes itself or and or joins with other theories and practices and interventions in the mental health field and the social sciences and beyond, certainly. Uh, one, one of the, uh, always the questions are always linked. Uh, your question is linked with the, the one just before. Usually, in the